Now, Ian didn't tell me that there'd be people who work at ASIO here, so I'm terrified. I better do a good job, right? So, uh, yeah. Now, the other thing is, uh, two things very quickly. We're going to have Q&A, and so I'm more than happy for you to ask any question uh, about the Bible history archaeology, but I will be very clear. If I can't answer it, I'll let you know. So you might say, you know, where is... Where's the Ark now, Ark of the Covenant? Where's Noah's Ark, all that kind of stuff? I don't know. I'll, um, I, I can't answer that question. The, the other thing that Ian did say, Ian said that I can speak for twice as long as he preaches. <laughs> so uh, get comfortable, I guess. So that's what I say. Now, um, you've got an outline there. Has anyone not got an outline that wants one? Just as you... Yeah, there's one... Down the front, um, you might want to take notes. Um, I've got a bunch of slides here. I've got over 50 slides because archaeology and history is a very visual thing. So it's really important that uh, uh, you can see. So if you're more, is the word site challenge? Come down the front. But let me tell you a bit about myself. Uh, who am I? I'm the pastor of Marsfield Community Church, which is right near Macquarie Uni, if you know the ride area right around there in Sydney. Um, I graduated from Moore College in 2008. Now, I was studying archaeology and ancient history at Macquarie Uni. Um, they closed up that, uh, that course, and now I'm doing it at um, Australian uh, Catholic University. Now, there's a caveat, right? Um, I do not have a terminal degree in archaeology or history or anything. I am still learning. I've been uh, reading, I think, an hour a day on this topic since 2017. Um, and so I, I still consider myself a learner, and I hope I, I will always consider myself a learner. And, and so I don't know everything about everything to do with this. I'm trying to work my way through the big questions of, of archaeology, history, and the Bible so I can be helpful to people and uh, especially helpful to Christians, as you're going to hear. Um, but just a little story. I'm, when I went to a Macquarie Uni for the first time, I, wa I looked around and I was the oldest in the room by about 15 years. And um, I was the person down the front, having done all the readings, taking all the notes, asking, some of you guys know, have got people at uni like this, taking all the notes, asking all the questions. And after one of the lectures, uh, there was a group of you know, 18 to 20 year olds that were talking in a group and they were mentioned TMAS. And I was freaking out because I had done more than enough reading and all this kind of stuff. I listened to the lecture, I asked the questions, I did not hear TMAS and I was like, I'm missing out on some stuff here because I don't know what TMAS is. So I walked over to them and I said, excuse me, you guys mentioned TMAS and, and I didn't hear that in the lecture, what's TMAS? Everyone except one person kind of looked down really sheepishly and the one person who wasn't looking down said, you're TMAS. And I was like, what do you mean? And he goes, Typical mature age student. <laughs> so that's who I am. Uh, now, here's the question. Why am I passionate about archaeology, history, and the Bible? Let me tell you a story. Um, when I was 20, I went, uh, I grew up in uh, northwest New South Wales in a place called Moree, and I went down to Sydney uh, on the train. It's, it was 11 hours back in the day, and uh, I went and saw a guitarist named Steve Vai. Uh, anyone know Steve Vai? A few of you guys do. Went and saw Steve Vai, great concert, two and a half hours, amazing. And uh, the day before I was going to, going to go back, I was like, what am I going to do on the train? Because this is before internet, you know, and iPhones and everything. So I, I went to the local Dimmix, I went to the religious section, and because I thought there'd be a great Christian book at Dimmix, and I found this book, Why Christianity Must Change or Die by a dude named John Shelby Spong, right? And in the first couple of pages, he's basically saying, no ancient historian believes the Bible. No, no modern historian believes that the Bible, uh, the things in the Bible actually happen. So Jesus didn't rise from the dead, the gospel of uncle, history, and that kind of thing. That rocked my world. And I went back to Moree, and I went to the local Christian bookstore. 
And they had a book by I.H. Marshall called I Believe in the Historical Jesus. This is I.H. Marshall there. He's an evangelical and gave me reasons as to why I can believe the Bible. Um, I found on the internet, this is, this is uh, 1999, so just as the internet's uh, coming to Maury, actually, and I found that this guy, I.H. Marshall, was at Aberdeen University. I wrote him a letter and said, I've just read your book. This is what's happened. He wrote back to me and sent me a book and, and gave me some questions. He didn't tell me how to think, or sorry, what to think, but he taught me how to, how to think. And so we, we wrote back probably six times, right? And if, I, if it wasn't for I.H. Marshall, I wouldn't be a Christian. And so, and so a few years ago, there was a bunch of friends who were really rocked in their faith because they had read uh, a book by a guy named Israel Finkelstein that we'll hear later, Israel Finkelstein and Neil Silverman. And, and they said, well, I can't believe anything in the Old Testament, Right? And there was no book, no easy level book that I could give to them. And I was talking to a friend of mine who's an Old Testament scholar. He lectures Old Testament Morling uh, College in uh, Sydney. And I said, you should write this book. And he goes, I wouldn't know where to start. I haven't studied history. He said, why don't you write this book? And so the idea is for me to study all this kind of stuff and hopefully in the future to write some books. But in the meantime... I love to go and give talks like this. So that's why I'm so passionate. And my hope is that you walk away with greater confidence that, uh, that what, ha- what the Bible says happened in the Old Testament, you have greater confidence that it's good ancient history. That's what I'm hoping. Okay, what are we trying to do tonight? The first is what, uh, we're trying to understand what archaeology is. What is archaeology? The second thing that we're trying to do is to understand the limits of archaeology. I think a lot of the time you will hear archaeologists talk in a way that archaeology solves all our ancient historical problems, that archaeology does so many things, and yet a lot of the time archaeology doesn't answer the questions we want it to answer. There's a limit to what archaeology can and can't do. The third thing that we're going to do tonight is understand how the Bible and archaeology interact, right? Uh, Fourthly, we're going to start to be able to critique what people say about archaeology in the Bible because you will read, especially on the internet, both pro the Bible and against the Bible, Some people will say really ridiculous things from archaeology and the Bible. And and some things that that the archaeology doesn't support and and the ancient history doesn't support. And so hopefully by the end of tonight you're going to be able to go, well, actually I can see through that. If you want, want, uh, when you go home, you can look up at the Gospel Coalition Australia. I've written an article just recently on... This called uh, the Mount Ebal curse tablet, where I basically say everything that these guys who believe the Bible say about this curse tablet is wrong. So you can read it. Oh, you don't have to read it now. Um, so anyway, and the last thing that we're trying to do is we're trying to have fun because I think ancient history and um, the Bible is really fun. Um, a few years ago, I was over in uh, London with my family and we went to the British Museum and I was geeking out like anything, and, um, and I was taking my kids through, and I said, oh, see this, this is how, this is how it relates to the Bible, this is, this is a brick from you know, Nebuchadnezzar's time, all this kind of stuff. And my daughter just looks at me, and she goes, oh, Dad, you don't have to give us a lecture at every point. And, I, and she goes, I already believe the Bible. And, uh, <laughs> and then my son goes, yeah, Dad, this is boring. So hopefully you won't find it boring. Anyway, so that's what we're doing. Okay, why... Is, now, here's the question. Why, why study the archaeology if we have the Bible? Uh, if we've got the Bible, the Bible is God's word. It's inspired. It's inerrant. Why study it? Okay, th- I think there's a few reasons. The first is it gives us greater knowledge about ancient Israel and its people. So the Bible uh, doesn't give us an exhaustive account of everything, an exhaustive account of ancient Israel. So archaeology can fill that in. It gives us cultural background, as we're going to see. Uh, there's, uh, there's thousands of years between us and the ancient Israelites. And so there's some things that we read in, in the Bible that we go, oh, well, this is what they're doing. 
because we're putting our culture onto theirs and therefore we're actually making mistakes when we interpret the Bible. And so what we're, excuse me, what we're trying to do is give us more cultural background about the Bible so that we can understand the Bible. Now, the archaeology confirms some, some parts of the Bible. It says these things happen or these people existed, right? It also challenges us to go back and look at the Bible and or archaeology again more closely. So there might be some things where the archaeology says something, the Bible seems to say something different, and we've got to look at it a bit more closely. Now, one of the things that we've got to realise when, when coming to the Bible, we've got to realise that the Bible is theological history. It's theological history. It is history, but it's primarily theological, right? And so, so I say that because the Bible writers have got a specific agenda in mind. They're not trying to give us everything that I would want them to say about everything about Israel, right? So they don't talk about diet much, for example. They don't talk about uh, much about uh, the political sphere outside of Israel. The Pharaoh of the Exodus frustratingly for me, is not mentioned. They don't give him a name, right? There's things like that that as an ancient historian, I would want them to say, but they don't say it because it's a theological history. It's not a political history. A lot of people will say, oh, well, the Bible, the Bible writers didn't know certain things. And I go, well, how do you know that? Well, because they didn't put it in. No, they've got a different agenda, just because they don't put something in doesn't mean they didn't know it. it, just means their agenda is a lot different from yours or mine. And so we've got to realise that the Bible is trying to do something that may be a bit different from you know, the questions that we've got for, the ancient historical questions that we've got. Okay, let's keep going. What is archaeology, right? Archaeology, here's my definition, is the study of ancient people through the recovery and analysis of their material culture. Archaeology is the study of ancient people through the recovery and analysis of their material culture. Now, I have not been on an archaeological dig. I was going to go uh, on one last January, but there was a thing called COVID. Did you guys have that in Canberra? Yeah, you did. That messed up everything. But basically, what you see is an archaeological dig here. What are they doing? They're digging through stuff. And archaeology is basically destroying things. Because basically, if you come to, just say you dig up uh, under a bunch of dirt, you dig up a, what you think is a temple, and it's from 600 BC. Well, how are you going to get down to 1000 BC? Well, you're going to dig through that. You're going to destroy it to get to the thing. So it's this kind of, you're kind of destroying things with archaeology as you go down. But what is archaeology? I'll repeat that. Archaeology is the study of ancient people through the recovery and analysis of their material culture. Material culture, what do we mean by that? It's the stuff they left behind. And generally, what we're talking about generally is the rubbish people left, leave behind. Not all the good stuff. No one goes, oh, 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 I've got this very expensive fine china. I will bury it in the backyard so archaeologists can get it. No, it's usually the rubbish, right? Okay. What, what is archaeology not? It's not this guy. <laughs> Indiana Jones. Who has not seen Indiana Jones? You haven't. I'll pray for you now, let's pray. No, I'm joking. You, you should watch it, it's great. Um, and it's not about, it's not for X marks a spot or anything like that. It's not about finding treasure, or buried treasure, right? Although I do think, I do think um, Indiana Jones does get one thing right. If you remember Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark, where do they say the Lost Ark is? Does, any, does anyone remember? It's in Egypt. Why? Does anyone remember? Because if you watch the movie, they say Pharaoh Shishak or Shoshank, it's Shishak in the Bible, Shoshank in Egypt, same guy. 
He took it back to Egypt, and I think that's what probably happened to the Ark of the Covenant. When uh, Shishak and Shoshank, we've got a, uh, in 1 Kings 14, 25, it talks about Pharaoh uh, Shishak coming through. We've got Pharaoh Shoshank once again, same guy. They're just spelled a little bit differently in the different languages. Uh, Egypt says they you know, came through, raided Israel. In 1 Kings, it says he raided Israel, took, stripped all the gold from the, uh, the temple, took it back. So if you're wondering where the Ark of the Covenant is, it's probably somewhere in Israel. No, probably got demolished for the gold. But anyway, yeah. so Indiana Jones does get something right. Okay, let's have a look. How do we know how old things are? So you dig up a pot in ancient Israel, and, and, you know, people say, oh, this pot is from the time of David. How do they know that? How do you know that uh, a certain thing is, oh, well, let's have a look. Okay. First of all, we've got to start thinking through different ages or time periods. So everyone's called the Stone Age, where, my, where a lot of people, a lot of my kids, not all my kids think I'm from. So Stone Age, where they're thinking 3,300 BC. So 3,300 years before Christ is the Stone Age, right? The Bronze Age is 3,300 to about 1,200 BC. Now, one of the things that you've got to realise about these ages is they're broken up. So you will hear archaeologists talk about the Early Bronze Age, the Middle Bronze Age, and the Late Bronze Age. So the Late Bronze Age, for example, goes from 1550 BC to 1200 BC. And in the middle of that, you'll hear archaeologists and historians talk about Late Bronze Age... Uh, LBA, Late Bronze Age A and B and that kind of thing, or LB1A and 1B and that kind of thing. So we've got the Iron Age from 1200 to 586 BC, the Neo-Babylonian period 583 to 539 BC, the Persian period 539 to 332 BC, the Hellenistic period 332 BC to 63 AD. And so most, uh, when you read archaeology, ancient history, especially of Israel, they'll be talking about those kind of things. And so it's really important to actually understand the, the time periods that they're talking about. So they are it. But, and here's the other thing. An archaeologist doesn't generally dig up, in Israel, doesn't dig up a, just a patch of land. They go to things called tells. Now, this is the tell of ancient Jericho, right? And what the ancients used to do is they would build a city and then they would build straight on top of it. They generally did not go down to bedrock again. And so what, you, what happens over time is you've got a city on a city on a city on a city, right? And that's what happens to ancient Jericho, for example, which goes to 8,000 BC. It is the longest city that was continuously occupied. And so you, you'll, get, uh, you'll get strata. And what strata is, is the different levels that you can see. People say, and I think this is helpful, it's like a birthday cake, right? Where you'll be able to see the different levels in a birthday cake. It's the same kind of thing. And so what you'll see here is, you can see, uh, you, you, you can see the, that rocky bit up the top, which is a level of strata, which is something they will probably look at. And the different levels, you can see generally by the different colours or shapes of the, uh, of the rock, of the stones, of the, of the dirt, sometimes different coloured dirt. And so what you usually do will, you'll have a drawing like this, right? Where you can see the different cities in a, a tell, right? And the, the more you get through the tell, the older you go back. So on the bottom of the tell, that's the older city and so on and so forth. You could have an exploded tell diagram or strata diagram like this, where, they, where, where you can see they've taken layers off and they're trying to explain every, every part of it. So you've got the city wall and tower down there, the, the place of earthen ramp, thick mud brick wall, foundation trench, Philistine industrial zone. This is taken from a textbook and each of those levels that, that is mentioned there 
has a gap of about 100 years between them because what they've done is they've just built on, on top of each other. And that's how you get strata. So it's, so, and here's the thing. Sometimes strata is very easy, right? It's very easy to go, oh, this is level, this level, this level. But a lot of the time it's not. Some, because humans like to mess things up. Sometimes what you'll find is there's someone's dug a pit or someone's, uh, or there's been an earthquake or maybe even gone down uh, to, to bury a loved one, that kind of thing. So, so strata can look all over the place. Okay. Now, one of the things that, that we dig up all the time, or archaeologists dig up, is pottery. And this is how they date things, right? They date it through the analysis of pottery, or what's called pottery typology. So, for example, the, this kind of pottery that's in the bottom left is called Philistine monochrome pottery, or MYC3B, if you want to write that down. Now, what, what this means, if you find this, is that, uh, and find it in, uh, in a lot, you know, in an Israelite setting, that these guys had trade with the Philistines. If you find it in a place like Gath or Ekron or something like that, and you find it in abundance, you have found yourself a Philistine stronghold, right? The, this, uh, this pottery in the bottom right is um, uh, Canaanite pottery, right? And so there's specific things that a, an archaeologist is looking for in the, pot, uh, in, in the shapes of the pottery and in the decorations. Up the top left, that is Israelite pottery from around 1200 to 1000 BC. Now we know it's Israelite pottery from that because it's really badly made, right? A lot of people say if you're not really cultured, they'll say, you're such a Philistine. Can I just say Philistines were really, really cultured. It was the Israelites back in the day who were the Hicks. So really, they, they, you shouldn't say, hey, you're a Philistine. You should say, hey, you're an Israelite, okay? Um, the pottery up on the top right hand corner came from a place called Kerbet Kiafa. And I can talk about it at length, but I won't. But uh, basically, this pottery, they've used this pottery to say this is from around Saul's time to David's time, uh, this particular site. And so what, what archaeologists will do is they will find sometimes whole parts of pottery, sometimes little sherds, and it's interesting to see an archaeologist pick up a shirt and go, oh, yeah, that's from the 10th century, very quickly. It's like we would read A, B, C, D, E, F, G. They read it that quickly also. And so I've seen videos of archaeologists. They'll, get, they'll dump out a whole bunch of uh, pottery shirts, and they're just basically putting, they've got it in different buckets from Iron Age 1 and all this kind of stuff, and they're just basically throwing it really quick because they can read it that quick. Um, it's a bit like uh, Coke cans or cars, right? Or Coke bottles or cars. I drink Coke because uh, I'm a Christian. And, um, and when I was a kid, um, you, if you wanted to get a 500ml bottle of Coke, it came in a glass bottle, right? Before that, you know, the glass bottles had different shapes, right? Now, it comes in a plastic bottle, right? And so just say if... Um, you know, Canberra got flattened, right? And a thousand years' time, archaeologists could come back. They would go, well, they find all these Coke bottles and they're all PET plastic. And so they would go, because they wouldn't biodegrade, of course, and they would find them and they'd go, oh, well, this is from this time period because this is the time period that people drank Coke out of PET plastic. If it was from the 80s, you would find a bunch of glass Coke bottles. That's the kind of thing that we're doing with pottery, right? Or it's a bit like cars, right? There's different types of cars here, and you know when they're from because that's when they were made, right? My, my dad was uh, so into cars, and he could tell when a Holden Commodore was made just by looking at the, the back, uh, the boot of it because he could see that there was a d different shape and everything. I didn't really care, but he could, right? And that's the same with pottery. Now, what you've got here is pottery handles here, 
which are a diagnostic tool. Uh, you, you would find a pottery handle, and you could pretty, t if, you're, if you're an archaeologist who knows his stuff, which I'm still learning, you will be able to look at the handle and go, well, this is from David's time, or this is from 600 BC, or 1500 BC, based on the pottery handle, and that's all you would need. Okay, so how do you tell when things are old? It's basically by pottery, generally. There's carbon-14 dating, which the problem with carbon-14 dating is it, it still gives you a roundabout time period, right? So it'll give you uh, a time period. It might say, oh, well, 986 BC, right? And you go, well, that's great. But then if you read the fine print, it is usually plus or minus 30 to 50 years. So it could be 986 BC or it could be 1036 BC or 936 BC, right? Carbon-14 dating, the more you go back, the less accurate it is. But let's talk about archaeological methodology. And what we're talking about here is the way we think about archaeology and the Bible, how they interact, because there's different schools of thought. There's a guy named W.F. Albright, and he was a genius. He could, he could write and read a number of different ancient languages. He was the guy, uh, primarily, who came up with being able to look at different types of pottery and date them. So that's where we get him from. Absolute brilliant guy. Now, he, he came to the Bible, an archaeology, the Bible in one hand and a trowel in the other. So he, he thought that the Bible was going to be proved by archaeology. Archaeology was going to prove the Bible. And so he was always looking at the Bible and trying to find what the Bible said in the archaeology. Now, the problem with that is, and we're going to see this later, is that sometimes if you are so desperate to find what, what is in the Bible in archaeology that you're going to make mistakes and you're going to find something that is not really there and you're going to say it proves the Bible. And then what you're going to do is, well, what's going to happen is a later scholar is going to say, actually, that didn't work, that doesn't work. And then people will say, therefore, the Bible's wrong. And actually, not the Bible's wrong. Unfortunately, our presuppositions or methodology might be wrong. So that's, that's W.F. Albright, and he's a biblical archaeologist. That's what he called himself. And then there's a guy named William Dever. I, I've read tons of William Dever. He was a fundamentalist, right? He grew up in a Christian home and kind of gave it away around uh, college time. But he says archaeology is a primary source. So what that means is, for the, for the study of ancient history, he, uh, ancient Israel, he will go and reconstruct ancient Israel as much as he can from the archaeology and then bring the Bible in. But here's the problem with that, right? The archaeology is kind of mute, right? So if you find a city from the 10th century, what does that say? What does that mean? Well, you need a narrative for it to fit into so it makes some sense or it can speak better. So there needs to be something a bit different from this. Then there's a guy named Israel Finkelstein. Israel Finkelstein, I think I've read more of him than anyone else. He says this, Biblical history did not take place in either the particular era or the manner described. Some of the most famous events in the Bible clearly never happened at all. So Israel Finkelstein, he will say, on archaeological grounds, the Exodus didn't happen. Joshua's conquest didn't happen. He will say that um, David and Solomon weren't great kings of a great empire. They were merely goat herders or sheep herders. So this is Israel Finkelstein. He is using the Bible, or using archaeology, to say that the Bible's wrong. And then there's, uh, there was a movement that's, that was started in the 80s, really took off in the 90s, by uh, a, a bunch of guys they call them the Copenhagen School. They weren't just at Copenhagen. They were like Philip Davies. Uh, they were uh, in uh, England and also Copenhagen, mainly Europe. And these guys weren't archaeologists at all, but they said there was no ancient Israel. So the whole Bible's a myth. This guy says that uh, King David was a myth like uh, King Arthur. Okay. Now, uh, and can I just say, pretty much every archaeologist that I've read 
would just go, don't really interact. Well, some of them interact a bit with these guys, but really hardcore archaeologists just dismiss them, even though biblical studies guys love these guys. Okay, but then there's what I call the new biblical archaeology, and other people call it the new biblical archaeology too. What we're trying to do is we're going to study the Bible for all it's worth and say, here's what the Bible says. Then what we're going to do is study the archaeology independent of the Bible, and then we bring them together. So we're not, we're not, the idea, the methodology is that the study of the Bible and the study of the archaeology aren't cross-contaminating each other. We're not looking for in the archaeology what the Bible says, and we're not, not using the archaeology to necessarily prove what the Bible says. We're just studying them on their own and then bringing them together. Okay. So what is the result of that study? When we look at the Bible, we study it independently, and we look at the archaeology, and when we study it independently, then bring it together. First of all, there's confirmation, right? There's, 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 a very, there's very few things that archaeology can confirm in the Bible, right? But sometimes we see confirmation, right? Then there's some convergences. I think there's a lot of convergences. Now, let me tell you what a convergence is. A convergence is when the archaeology says one thing and the Bible seems to say exactly the same thing. So, for example, the archaeology, we go back to um, uh, Pharaoh Shishak. You know when I talked about Indiana Jones? Okay, so you've got in, in 1 Kings 14.25, I think it is, Shishak invading uh, Israel at uh, 925 BC. What, what you've got also at, in Egypt is he wrote a bunch of towns that he destroyed, right? Then you go to those towns and you see destruction layers pretty much around the same time that the Bible says he invaded. And so what the archaeology shows is that there was destruction layers at these, at these towns at a particular time. And the, and, and the Bible says that Pharaoh Shishak came and fought against a particular, particular group of towns, the same group of towns, at the same time. Now, can we say that proves the Bible? I don't think so. Because a destruction layer could have been brought out by Pharaoh Shishak or someone else. We just don't know. All we can say is that the archaeology and the Bible seem to tell the same story. They converge, right? Now, I'm being very careful here because one of the things I, uh, um, evangelicals do when they come to archaeology is that they push the uh, archaeology into history beyond what we can say, right? I, I think it's irresponsible to say more than what we can say, and that's why, why I will say, actually, I think it converges at this play, point, but I, I don't think it's a knockdown argument for the proof of the Bible, okay? The other thing it can do is give us cultural background, right? Uh, as I said before, the Bible doesn't say everything about ancient, ancient Israel and the ancient Israelites, so archaeology fills us in and gives us some cultural background. And the fourth thing is it can bring up what look to be contradictions. Now, I used to say it, it, it used to give us uh, uh, confusion, right? And what I used to say is when you study the Bible and you study the archaeology, sometimes it, they don't match up and that's confusing. But if you read uh, skeptics of the Bible, they say it's contradictions. It's a contradiction. So I'm using the word contradictions and here's why. We're going to talk about a contradiction and I put that in inverted commas so that, and I'm going to show you how we work through it, so that if you read something or you hear something that the Bible and archaeology is in contradiction, you can start, you don't freak out over that because you shouldn't because there's a lot of interpretation when it comes to archaeology, but you can start thinking through how do you manage this kind of thing where it seems that the Bible and the archaeology may not actually you know, square 100%. Okay? And the other thing is, I think we are people of truth. So we speak the truth. We don't fudge. We don't lie just to make ourselves a bit more comfortable, right? Okay, let's have a look. 
What does archaeology do? The first thing, it confirms some parts of the Bible. Let's have a look. Now, this is the Tel Dan inscription, right? It is a 9th century stela. A stela is basically an ancient billboard. Basically, if I was a king, I would say, hands of Marsfield came to St. Matt's of Waniassa and gave a talk, and there was 2 million people. They all loved it, and we had 1,000 people become Christians. Or so, yeah, something like that, I would say that to the glory of me. You know, and so that's what they would do. And you would put these billboards around because basically every, every ancient king was like Donald Trump back in the day. That's what they did, right? And so the Tel Dan inscription uh, was a 9th century uh, steel found at Dan in the north of Israel, right? Fragment A, which is the big fragment here, was found in 1993. Fragments B1 and B2, they're not the bananas in pyjamas, but B1 and B2, they're on the left. They were found in 1993. It's a triumphal inscription commissioned by Haziel, it should say Haziel of Damascus, right? And it's basically saying, uh, probably saying, hey, I, Haziel, I've come in and destroyed Israel. But line 9 mentions the house of David, Bayat Duid, the house of David. Now, why is this significant? This is the first inscription that mentions the historical David. And back in the ancient, uh, ancient world, the house of somebody meant that this was a king who founded that house. It meant a, a very culturally significant king. So you would have the house of Omri, the house of Ahab. We've got inscriptions like that. But this mentions the house of David. Now, when this came to light, uh, uh, it's, it made people called epigraphers who would study these inscriptions go back and, and have a look at a bunch of different inscriptions. And one of them was this one, the Meshastella. The Meshastella uh, is a 9th century, so same, same century as, uh, as the Tel Dan inscription, commissioned by King Mesha of Moab. So from a different place, King Heziel of Damascus. Now this is King Mesha of Moab. It gives a parallel account of the war between the coalition of Israel, Judah, and Edom, and Moab from 2 Kings 3, right? So if you want to read your Bible tonight, 2 Kings 3, and then you can go and... Uh, Google the Meshastella and you'll find this, right? Line 6 mentions King Omri from the Bible. And then in line 31, it's very damaged. It's one of the, one of the damaged lines down here. It's got a probable, a probable mention of, once again, the house of David. So once again, uh, a bunch of people based on the Tel Dan inscription went back to the Meshastella and went, Actually, I think this is saying, this is talking about the same thing, the house of David, right? Then we've got Shoshank's Karnak inscription. Shoshank was the guy who came in, the Indiana Jones uh, um, pharaoh, and his biblical Shishak of 1 Kings 14.25. He raided Canaan in 925 BC, which I've said. He listed the Israelite cities destroyed, and row 8 has a very, it's a damage once again, but it has a possible, a possible mention of the heights of David, where he, uh, where Shoshank went. So what do we have, right? Sorry. We have a definite reference to David in the Tel Dan inscription, a definite reference. We have a probable reference in King David, to King David in the Meshastella. We have a possible reference to King David in Shoshank's inscription. So what does this confirm? We've got confirmation that David was a significant, a culturally significant king who ruled. Because we've got potentially three different, uh, three different countries acknowledging that there was a King David who ruled. Right? Now, what does this not confirm? A whole bunch of things. It doesn't confirm that David killed Goliath. It doesn't confirm that David uh, slept with Bathsheba. It doesn't confirm that David was, you know, wrote a bunch of psalms or played the harp or was good looking or whatever. It, it con but it confirms that he was a culturally significant king, which is what the Bible says. Now, can you see 
uh, my restraint here in saying what the bio, what we can say definitely, what it confirms definitely, and what it doesn't. Now, I want to be very clear. I believe all those things about David. I believe the Bible about David. I'm saying that this doesn't confirm those, and, we, and that's okay. Because when you think about it, how can archaeology confirm that David played the harp or did what he did with Bathsheba and so on and so forth, right? And so I say that because there, there are apologists who will go to the tell down inscription and go, therefore it proves everything about David. It just doesn't. And we've got to be careful, okay? Because if we don't speak the truth, it will actually trip up other Christians or it may trip up people who go, oh, well, we've got the tell down inscription that proves the whole Bible, and then people look into it and go, well, it doesn't, and we come off looking foolish and like we're liars, and we don't want to do that. Okay, so it, it uh, confirms some parts of the Bible. It converges with some parts of the Bible. Remember, convergence is the archaeology says something, the Bible seems to say the same thing, right? I'm going to give you a few now. Okay, Hatsor. Hatsor is in the north of uh, Israel, and it was destroyed in 1200 BC. Now, I hope you can see that you can see a dark line here, right? That, that is, uh, archaeologists love burn layers. This is a burn layer, right? And what you see here, can you see the cracks here in those bricks? Basically, archaeologists are saying, all archaeologists say that the fire there was so hot that, that it broke stone. It was that hot, right? It turns some stone to glass. So what we see in Hatsor, it was destroyed around 1200 BC. We see that there's a huge fire in, in the governmental section and the religious section, right, of Hatsor. And it, and it destroyed Canaanite idols. Back in the day, if you, if you took over a city, you would find their idols and you would take it back as plunder. Not in Hatzor around 1200 BC. They actually just destroyed them. They just left them there and destroyed them. Now when you have a look at the conquest in Joshua, it's dated to around, I date it, to around 1250 to 1210 BC. Hatzor is burned, Joshua 11, 11. The Canaanite kings were killed, uh, Joshua 12, so they really went after the government of Canaan, right? And in Deuteronomy 7, 25 to 26, what are they meant to do? They're meant to destroy idols. So can you see how this doesn't confirm the Bible, but the picture in archaeology and the picture in the Bible converge, right? Okay, let's have another look at another one. Around 1100, 1200 to 1100 BC, there's a bunch of... Uh, new hill country villages, hundreds of them, that just popped up out of nowhere, right? And, and one of the biggest debates in archaeology is where did these guys come from, right? And so you see a map of Israel, all those black dots are those new, um, those new villages, right? There's a population explosion, maybe a tenfold in increase, right? Conservative... Uh, uh, people on the conservative end would say it maybe was a fourfold increase. Some say actually it was tenfold, right? It's huge. And what they see from these small villages, it had an egalitarian culture, right? In Canaanite villages, you would have in the middle of the village a big palace where the king or someone ruled. There's no king or, or palace in any, of these, uh, in any of these villages. It was an egalitarian culture, right? And in it, in these, in, these, um, in these villages, there's no pig bones. They didn't eat pork. But if you go to the Philistine uh, cities on the coast, they ate pork. And there's no local temples, right? And there's no idols. There's no idols. There's no local temples. There's no, uh, there's, there seems to be kind of no religion that you can grasp with, with your hands. Then you turn to the book of Judges. Oh, sorry. And in, in that, you, there, there's a difference in pottery, right? Can, can someone point out what the difference between the bottom two pots and the top two pots are? What are some differences? The shape, there's shape. Sorry? Yeah, so adornment down, down the bottom. 
they, 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 uh, they've got drawings and paintings and that kind of thing, up top not. The top ones are really badly made. The bottom ones aren't. The, the bottom ones are typical Canaanite pottery from about 1500 to 1200 BC. The ones up the top uh, are, are pots found from those, uh, from those uh, villages that popped up over, uh, overnight. So you've got really terrible pottery with no adornment. And basically, in Canaanite villages, what you would have is this huge repertoire of pottery. You would have all these di different kinds of pottery. In those new villages, they just had very simple pots, some cooking pots, some eating pots, and that, that, a few other things. So it was a very simple uh, pottery uh, repertoire. And so when we go, and they had all, sorry, again, they had a new type of house. Okay, this type of house is called a pillared house or a four-roomed house. And what that meant, a Canaanite house basically uh, had, you, you know, you had to go through different rooms to get to the, 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 back, the back rooms. If you have a look at this, what you've got is every room having a, a uh, door into this middle courtyard. And what that meant is that if you, sorry to be indelicate, but if you're a lady in that time of the month, you could be up the back right corner of this house and the rest of the um, people could avoid you and therefore still be pure. And so what we see in the book of Judges is this. It's set in the Iron One, 1200 to 1000 BC, the same time that those, um, those, those uh, villages sprung up. The majority of judges come from the hill country, exactly where we find those villages. They had an egalitarian culture. In those days, there was no king in Israel. And they had a clash with Canaanite and Philistine culture. The Canaanite and Philistine culture was a high cult were high cultures, right? And it seems like these people in, the, um, in, the, in those villages distinguished themselves in every single way by the pottery, by the religion, by the makeup of their houses, by the, by the town planning that they had, or, or that kind of thing, from Philistine and Canaanite culture. Why? Probably because they clashed. Probably because that there was problems with it. And so once again, can you see how the book of Judges paints a picture? And the archaeology seems to paint the same picture. There's a convergence here. I'll give you one last one. The archaeology of Solomon. There was a guy named Yigal Yudin, and he's like a hero archaeologist. And he was digging up at uh, Hatsor, and he saw um, a, particular, a particular gate. Now, these are layouts of the gates at Hatsor, Geza, Hatsor, and Megiddo. Now, this is looking from the top down, right? Okay. And can you see how that there are these, these chambers in them. They're called six-chambered gates. What, what Yigal Yudin found is that they all came from the 10th century. He found that via looking at the pottery and finding that, that they were all coming from the 10th century, which is basically around the time of Solomon. Then he went back to the Bible. Uh, oh, here's a picture of the six chamber gates at Megiddo. If you want to go there, you can see, see that. This is from the ground, obviously. He then went back to the Bible and he read this. Here is the account of the forced labor King Solomon conscripted to build the Lord's temple, his own palaces, the terraces, the wall of Jerusalem, and Hatsor, Megiddo, and Gezer. So what we've got is we've got monumental architecture at Hatsor, Gezer, and Megiddo, and we've got the Bible saying, at the same time, Solomon built up Hatsor, Gezer, and Megiddo. Now, does that prove the Bible? I don't think it does, I th because what I would like to see is that, uh, you know, uh, an inscription that says Solomon was the ear or something like that. We're not going to find that, right? But basically, we've got the same picture in the Bible and archaeology. Now, now can I just say, if you're a his history buff, 
you probably heard of Israel Finkelstein trying to redate these, this, this stuff. I think he's wrong, but if you want to ask a question, you can ask it after. And um, you think this talk's going on long? You haven't heard me talk about that yet. Anyway, let's keep going. Okay, it gives us... The, the other thing that, that archaeology does, it gives cultural background to the Bible, right? And, and I'll be quick here, right? Okay, they, would, they dug up in Jerusalem a 7th century toilet from uh, Jerusalem. And what, what you've got to realise is that only the elites had toilets. Now, you're probably going, is there a hole right down there? No, they would just do their business in there and you would get your, um, they think that you would get your slave to actually scoop it out. But that's a whole different story. What they found, this is what archaeologists do, they, uh, they scrape the inside of that toilet and they were able to find microscopic particles of poo. And in that sediment samples, they revealed that the elites in Jerusalem in the 7th century had roundworm, tapeworm, whipworm, and pinworm eggs. So they're extremely unhealthy, right? Very unhealthy. And so you get a picture from this. Imagine how tired you would be working during the day if you've got all that in your guts. And they found that just from a, um, an ancient toilet. And can I just say, I'm pretty glad that the Bible doesn't mention this because it's kind of gross. But I just think it's kind of funny too. Here's the other one. Um, this is a temple at Arad from the 8th century. It's one of the, the um, uh, one, a temple that sprung up that was, that was not uh, what the... It was... A wrong temple. They shouldn't have put. They shouldn't have had. But there was worship here. And what you see is two standing stones here, up the back. And what you've got down here is two altars for incense. And what archaeologists did, they scraped these altars uh, for incense, and they found marijuana residue on the incense burners. So not only did you worship maybe Baal at this temple or something like that, you probably got high also. And um, it's again, kind of, kind of weird, kind of funny. So, um, okay. Now, there's sometimes where archaeology seems to contradict the Bible. Okay? And I'll give you one now. Let's have a look at this. Sorry. Okay. This is the conquest theory. W.F. Albright came up with this. This is the conquest theory of how Israel came into the land. He says this. He expected destruction layers, those burn layers we saw in Hatzor, to be at every site that the book of Joshua said the Israelites attacked. So he expected there to be these burn layers uh, at all these different places. Those, uh, we've dug up so many of those places, and guess what? Those destruction layers are just not there. Therefore, the Bible is wrong. How about I pray? No, I'm joking. Okay. I'll show you, right? Right? Now, we're going to look at a table, and I can't go through every line, but what I've tried to do is color code it, right? So remember, the key for the table is red means the site has been destroyed, or the Bible says it should be destroyed. Teal means there's occupied but no destruction. Either the Bible or archaeology says that. Yellow means occupied, and grey, it's not clear. Okay. Now, have a look at this. This is... They, uh, uh, on the left-hand side, you've got all the sites mentioned in Joshua. The next is where they are referenced. The biblical remarks, did you see destroyed, destroyed, destroyed? They're, they should be all red, but here's what, here's what the archaeologists have found. Well, some of them are abandoned. They're not there. Some of them, there's no destruction, but there's something there. And so when you go through like this and you see that there's differences in what the Bible says happened and what was found, you say, well, did Joshua get it all wrong? And so the Bible and archaeology seems to be in contradiction here. But then every time there's a contradiction or someone says there's a contradiction between archaeology and Bible, you've got to go back to archaeology, you've got to go back to the archaeological reports, not their interpretation of the reports, but you've also got to go back to the Bible. Because here's what you've got to realise. 
Um, biblical scholars make terrible archaeologists, right, generally. Archaeologists make terrible biblical scholars because they don't read the Bible well enough and biblical scholars don't read the archaeology well enough, right? Uh, I said that to one of the guys who taught me Old Testament at Moore College and he was, he was aghast and then we had a conversation and asked him about some archaeological things and he didn't know them. I said, well, kind of see my point. Um, <laughs> but anyway, that's a whole different story. Is this getting recorded? Yeah, it is. Uh, uh, okay, so... But then you go back to the Bible and you read Joshua again. Here's what it says. Joshua took all these royal cities and their kings and put them to the sword. He totally destroyed them as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded. Yet Israel did did not burn any of the cities built on their mounds except Hatzor, which Joshua burned. So the Bible actually says there was only one city in the north which was burned, and that's Hatzor, right? In relation, if you read the book of Joshua carefully, in relation to the cities in the book of Joshua, the verb saraph in the Hebrew, which is used for burning, is only used for the cities of Jericho, Ai, and Hatzor. That means that we should only find destruction layers or burn layers at Jericho, Ai, and Hatzor. Now, why, did not, why didn't they burn the rest? Because in the ancient world, if you destroyed a city, you would burn it. Why didn't they? Remember in the book of Joshua, even in the book of De- Deuteronomy, they were meant to come into the land and settle it. So why would you burn a bunch of places if you were going to settle there, right? Okay, and so when you go back to the Bible, you see, actually, we shouldn't expect burn layers at every place. W.F. Albright got it wrong, right? We should expect burn layers at three places, and we should expect, basically, not much else to happen. We should just see that these places were occupied, right? And that's about it. And yet, if you read an archaeological textbook, They will say the book of Joshua is wrong because of this contradiction. And yet, the problem is not with the archaeology or the Bible, but archaeologists' reading of the Bible. Okay. And so then when when we go back to our, um, our, our table it's, and we plug this data in. Remember, key for the table, red destroyed, teal occupied, no destruction, yellow unoccupied, grey not clear. Now, can you see how it, it lines up a lot better, right? So the biblical remarks are not destroyed, destroyed, but occupied. That's all we're looking for, right? And you can see that whether you take, then there's two, there's two uh, dates for um, the entry into Canaan, either around 1450 BC or 1250, which I take. You can actually see that they're occupied or it's unclear a lot of the time. Hatsaw, you can see it's destroyed either date. You can see Gibeon is occupied either date, so on and so forth. And you can go through and actually you see that the Bible stacks up quite well, right? It doesn't, now I'm not saying that it doesn't uh, make all the problems go away, but I would say that actually what we don't hear is a flat out contradiction what we have is there's some discrepancies, but if you have a look, there's a lot of sites here that we either don't know where they are or it's just unclear because we haven't dug enough. Because archaeologists, archaeologists will say, oh, we dug up all of this. Oh, I'll give you an example, right? I, 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 I was listening to a, a lady talk about... Um, about the Exodus and how there's no archaeological evidence for the Exodus, which is ridiculous on so many levels, and I can answer a question about that, but I won't. But she said, we've dug up the whole Sinai Desert, and I was like, do you know how big the Sinai Desert is? <laughs> like, like uh, it's so ridiculous, right? But what happens is you'll, you'll go to a place like uh, Kerbet Kiafa, and, and you may only dig up 10% in seven years. And so how do you know that all the evidence that you need to make a pronouncement out of the Bible is found in that 10%? Especially if in the book of Joshua, they merely, you know, burned only three places. How do you not know that over here you're not going to find a destruction layer that's actually, you think, should be there? 
Okay, so what does archaeology do? It gives us greater knowledge about Israel and its people and events. It gives us cultural background. It confirms some parts of the Bible. And it challenges us to go back and look at the Bible and or archaeology more closely. Now, can I just say, I don't think archaeology converges with all of the Bible. I don't think uh, archaeology confirms all of the Bible because there's a bunch of things that archaeology cannot converge with or confirm. Like I said, David in the Bible played the harp. There's no archaeology. You can't find any archaeological evidence for that unless there was an inscription somewhere that said that, right? And so I think the Bible is historically true and trustworthy, but you've got to realize that archaeology is a blunt tool. It can't answer everything. And so when archaeologists say, well, archaeology has proved the Bible right or proved the Bible wrong, they're both wrong. Because archaeology is not the tool that will do that. And archaeology is only one avenue into the history of the Bible. A fun avenue, but it's not the only one. I'm going to ask any questions. Yeah. Okay. So the question is: Is there archaeological evidence that um, that the Jewish history, as opposed to other histories, was more um, was less exaggerated? Um, what I would say is this, um, is that the biblical, picture, the biblical books were written in a specific time, right? And um, they, uh, they take on the genres around them, right? And so Joshua reads a lot like an ancient conquest account. So there's parts in the book of Joshua which say Joshua went and killed everybody, and then there's parts later on in the book of Joshua where it says there's still Canaanites in the land. So what do you do with that? Did Joshua kill everyone or did, um, did he not? And biblical critics will read that and go, there's a contradiction here. But if you read, if you read Joshua alongside ancient conquest accounts, what you see is when he says we killed everyone is just the typical hyperbole of an ancient conquest account. And you've got to read it not as, as a strict news report, but you've got to read it as an ancient conquest account. So the, I would say there are some parts where the Bible, I think, does exaggerate, like in the book of Joshua. But what I would say is that shouldn't make us not be not think that the Bible's wrong. It just makes us read the Bible better in its context. So I, I guess I, to your question, I can't give a definite yes or no answer. It's far more complex than that. But does that help? Help? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we might go. There's a question over here. Well, uh, just by coincidence, and it's only a few weeks ago, I read something which sort of suggests that there's a good deal better historical and archaeological evidence for uh, well, what's recorded in the Bible as happening 3,000 years ago compared with what's recorded as happening 4,000 years ago. Yeah. Now, you, you've just now mentioned archaeological evidence for the Exodus. Mm. What, how much evidence is there for that and, and for periods earlier, Abraham and so forth? Okay, so, so um, okay. let me talk about Abraham first. And one of the things that you've got to come, any archaeologist when they're trying to go, here's what an ancient text says, no matter if it's in the Bible or not, and here's what the Bible says, you've got to come with archaeological expectations. And what I mean by that is, if you read a text, you've got to go, what should I expect to find in the archaeology 
from this text. Now, who was Abraham? He was a shepherd. He didn't build anything. He, did a, he just went from place to place. And, you know, uh, he wasn't particularly courageous. Or, you know, we'll, we'll go in that. But from that, what, what, what should I find in the archaeology that would confirm Abraham? He's kind of average Joe Iraqi. He's probably a rich Iraqi guy because he came from that, that era. He went down to Egypt. He went up. I'm not sure that I can say, well, there's nothing... I should expect nothing in the archaeology that could confirm. But there are convergences. So, for example, uh, um, most, most historians would date uh, Abraham to about eight, 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 excuse me, 1800 BC. And around eight, 1800 BC, in Egypt, you've got these things called the Beni Hassan tomb. Right? And in the Beni Hassan tomb, there is a, there is a painting of Semites, people from Canaan or that area, coming into Egypt. And they, they seem to be rich. They've got camels, all that kind of stuff, right? And they are there. So what you've got here is a confirmation that around the time of Abraham, you've got people from Canaan, Canaan just like Abraham, coming in. Also, um, if we've got Hittite uh, laws and history from around that time. And we've got a lot of uh, parallels to that. So, for example, when um, Sarah gives um, Abraham his, uh, her maidservant to sleep with, there's actually laws that, that talk about that from around the same time. So what I would say with Abraham is it doesn't, conver- it doesn't confirm, but it converges in some things, only a few things. But what makes me think that Abraham is true is what I would call the criterion of embarrassment, right? If you're going to just say, the the argument that critical scholars have is that um, depending on where you date the writing of the book of Genesis, that the book of Genesis is written maybe in the 10th century, so 800 years after Abraham was around, or maybe the 7th, or maybe even the 2nd, right? But everyone says the people who wrote the book of Genesis were really into uh, God being one and, uh, you know, making sure that they put forward um, the right way of living for Yahweh. You then look at Abraham and you go, he didn't really live for Yahweh as the rest of the Old Testament says he does. He pimps out his wife twice, he doubts God, he, he does all these things wrong, Right? And so that would lead me to believe that they haven't made this stuff up. Because if you're going to make up the hero or the father of your faith, aren't you going to make him to be a person who always trusts in God, who always does the right thing, always does that? But that's not what we see. In fact, the Bible is unique in ancient literature because the Bible always emphasizes the flaws of the hero. The ancient literature never does that, right? Okay, now one thing about, um, you'll hear, is that the Israel, um, Abraham used camels, right? People go, oh, there's camels. And we haven't found a camel, an archaeological evidence for a camel, till about the 9th century, so 900 years after, after Abraham. So therefore, the Abraham story is wrong. Now, we may not have found, like an other archaeologists will say, well, we found a camel tooth in about 1500 BC, all that kind of stuff, right? But here's the thing. There are um, specific poems from around that time which talk about um, milking camels. Now, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't milk a wild camel, probably milk a domesticated one, right? Which actually goes to say that actually camels were domesticated around the time of Abraham. There may not be any archaeological evidence, but there's inscriptional evidence. So, so there's that. Now, the Exodus. Uh, this is a hard one, but once again, let's talk about archaeological expectations. You've got a bunch of people um, walking out of Egypt. Uh, they didn't build anything until they get to the Promised Land. We actually don't know where Mount Sinai is. There's 13 possible locations, right? 
and so what, what archaeological evidence would, would you leave? Some people say, well, surely Egypt would have said something. Surely there should be an inscription somewhere that says, oh, you know, Moses and, uh, you know, met with this pharaoh and that kind of thing. Can I just say, when people say, surely Egyptians should have said something, it's absolutely ridiculous. Because no ancient culture actually admitted defeat. So if, if, uh, if Yahweh defeated the gods of, of Egypt and all the... Um, all the people, all the Israelites went out, you wouldn't have a pharaoh going, hey, can you write that down for, so that in generations time they know that we got our butt kicked? It's, it's like, it, it is like, imagine Donald Trump just after he lost to Biden, putting a, 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 a tweet or even better, he, he bought a billboard in the middle of Times Square and said, I'm a loser, I just got beaten by Sleepy Joe. You wouldn't have that, and you wouldn't have that for the Exodus, right? But here's a couple of things. Here's a couple of convergences. One, um, I date the Exodus to be around in the 1200s, right? Or maybe even a bit earlier than that, right? What you see from about 1200 on, 1100 on, uh, Egypt tanks, its economy tanks, quite significantly. Now, there's two reasons for that, I think. Not only the Exodus, but if you read the book of uh, Joshua, in Joshua chapter 12, they killed a bunch of kings in Canaan. We know that those kings were vassal kings or vassal leaders of the places that were basically pillaging uh, Canaan to send food and everything back to Egypt. And so when, when Israel kills all those guys, it cuts off a significant amount of resources going back to Egypt. That's the first thing. The, the second thing is um, there's, uh, um, there's no doubt, there's absolutely no doubt that Semites, Canaanites, were used as slaves in Egypt. There's no doubt about that. No archaeologist or historian would ever doubt that. The next thing is, uh, we, we've got, um, once again, we've got paintings where Semites are actually making bricks, right? So the, the picture is the same. And not only as, I, as we saw earlier, what you've got as around the same time where you should expect Israelites coming into the land of Canaan, there's an explosion, a population explosion, right? So now, does that prove that the Exodus happened? No, but what you see is you've got some convergences between the archaeology and, and the, um, the biblical po- picture. So, does that answer your question? Okay. Sorry, I can talk about this all night. I'm sorry if I'm going a bit, a bit, uh, a bit on. Okay, there's a question up the back. Yep. Yeah. Uh, how much value is there in archaeology sites uh, removed from... Uh, the area we're talking about. I, I've been to Troy, for instance. Yeah. And they go back. They say they go back four and a half thousand years. So, is there any anything you can get out of Troy, which helps you identify other areas of interest to, tonight? Yeah. So, one one of the things that that you can do, not, maybe not Troy, but definitely Crete, for example. What they found in Crete is the um, is the same kind of pottery in Crete basically 50 years before the Philistines rocked up, and you can see that that Philistine monochrome pottery is very similar pottery is in Crete. And so you see a similar kind of pottery, and then you read the book of Amos, which says that the Philistines came from Crete. So you see little things like that. Once again, does that prove the Bible? No, but there's a convergence here, right? And so there's little things like that, but it's scant. So, yeah. There's a question down the front. Oh, sorry, there's a microphone. A oh, microphone coming. Uh, does the archaeology give uh, any light on the age, the great ages of the, um, you know, Abraham and so on, hundreds of years? Um, so uh, the question is, does um, archaeology give any light on the ages? What I would say is probably not, but I think as a historian, what I would say, excuse me, is um, I read the ages 
in the Bible. So 40 years, for example, right? Moses was 40 years in Egypt, 40 years in Midian, and then 40 years, you know, getting Egypt out, all that kind of stuff. I read that uh, in the ancient world, 40 years was a significant period of time. And so I don't read that as a literal 40 years. I just read, you know, there was significant periods of time, things like that. And so even when the Bible says um, there was 480 years between the Exodus and Solomon's temple, uh, the building of Solomon's temple, um, I think ancient Near Eastern cultures would use big amounts of time like that just to say there was a large amount of time. So when uh, I'm, I'm very hesitant to actually look at those, um, uh, look at those time periods and, say, and read them literalistically and say that it's got to be 480 years or it's got to be 40 years, I read them literally and what, what I mean by that is I take into account how other ancient uh, Near Eastern cultures would describe time periods like that and I would read them accordingly. Have I answered your question though? Okay. Ian? This, this better be a good one, right? Well, I'm disappointed. Okay. Because um, you studied some of this uh, at university. Yeah, only for one year. Yeah. Um, my question was we've been doing stuff on the covenants. Yep. And has there been, in terms of archaeology and covenants, is there any, any background information that yeah. we've picked up from there? Okay, so as, as Ian, I'm sure, told you, um, uh, not just ancient Israel, but uh, covenants were all around the ancient Near East, right? Everyone had covenants, right? Um, what's really interesting is that if you read Deuteronomy, it's basically five speeches or five covenants, right? Um, and what, there, there was a guy named uh, Kenneth Kitchen who studied the shape of covenants, right? Um, you know, the structure of them. And what he found was that the, uh, the structures of the covenants in Deuteronomy matches the covenants of the ancient Near East around 1300 BC or 12 to 1300 BC, which is exactly when the book of Deuteronomy, when Moses was hanging out, speaking about speaking to the Israelites about Deuteronomy. So once again, does that prove the Bible? No, but what we've got is a convergence there, right? And so, yeah, does, I'm not sure. Does that answer your question? Yeah? Okay. I'm curious about archaeologists' opinion of the resurrection yep. and, you know, if there is any archaeological kind of suggestions of the resurrection. Yeah, so... Um, so I haven't really looked at too much of the New Testament, but, but if, you go to, um, if you go to Jerusalem, you can go into the church where there's meant to be a, the, the church built around where Jesus was buried and that kind of thing. But once again, it is, the question is, what, what, should, what should our archaeological expectations be of the resurrection? If Jesus just walked out of a tomb what archaeological evidence would that leave? And I would say probably none. And so that doesn't mean it's not true or it's not historically right. It just means that archaeology is the wrong tool to assess the historicity of the resurrection. So kind of frustrating answer to your question. I'm sorry, but that's what I'd say. Question? Yep. Hello. Um, I know you mentioned at the start that, uh, you know, where this, where's the location of Noah's Ark is a question yep. that you can't answer. Yep. Um, perhaps looking at it more broadly, though, in terms of uh, evidence of a global flood yep. or some similar event, maybe that's more a geological question, yeah, yeah, yeah. but is there, is there much in the archaeological record of an event like that? Yeah, so what I would say is that every ancient culture, uh, no matter, almost no matter where you are in the ancient world, has got a flood narrative. And so, you know, a lot of people would say, well, it's all myths. I'm like going, well, it's got to point to something. Right, um, it, 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 I think it points to some kind of huge flood, right? And even um, even uh, you, you see that there is generally in those flood narratives, kind of the humans have displays the gods, which is in the Noah the Noah flood narrative too. Also, if uh, I know you didn't ask about this, but um, the Tower of Babel, right? What's very interesting is that a lot of ancient cultures have got a narrative 
where the humans or the animals, who are all speaking the same language, um, get really arrogant. And the gods or the god or, or someone actually says, you're going to, um, you're going to speak all different languages. So, so you, you, you know, the, the, there's tantalizing little pointers to that, right? So, for example, I was at Taronga Zoo with my kids and um, there was a guy showing us around and he told a story of the Aboriginal Dreamtime because there was a lyre bird there and uh, one of the stories was the lyre bird got, the, got um, the, the ability to speak all these different kinds of languages that the animals spoke because he was the only one that was humble. All of the rest were arrogant. They used to speak all the same language and now they don't. And he says that's how, um, that's how all people got the different languages. And I said to my wife, oh, what does that sound like? And my son goes, oh, the Tower of Babel, Dad. So... Uh, <laughs> There you go. And then everyone looked at us weird because we were the Christian family. Yeah. Uh, question? Sorry, back to Egypt. Yep. Uh, any evidence for Joseph or the seven years of famine that he administered through? Uh, there, I would say that there's a period of time called the Hyksos time where the Hyksos were a group of people that... Um, uh, were from Canaan, and they ruled Egypt for a period of time, right? And that's roughly around the same time that jo uh, Joseph um, Joseph uh, ruled, right? Now, one of the things that, that I'm not sure if anyone's re watched the... It was on Netflix a while ago, Patterns of Evidence. Anyone watch Patterns of Evidence? And you see, like, there's... Um, there's a guy named David Roll who's written all this stuff, and he says, oh, well, therefore, we can, we can see that there's Joseph there because in this particular tomb there was this statue of a guy and he had the hair of a Canaanite, which he, this guy, this statue did, and he had these robes, these colourful robes, therefore this was Joseph. Can I just say everything David Roll pretty much says is wrong? And so you take this... this um, you read his work and he just fudges a bunch of stuff. He fudges dates like anything. He pushes all the dates 200 years uh, or 300 years later, all this kind of stuff. So, um, so I, uh, I'm saying about Joseph, I don't know enough. It's, if there was, I think it would be scant evidence. Um, Joseph probably wouldn't have been called Joseph. He would probably have an Egyptian name, so that's going to uh, make it even harder. So, yeah, I'm sorry I can't give you specific, yeah. yeah. Question up back. When I was reading about uh, making the Ark of the Covenant, yep. and um, first of all, first question, where did all that gold come from? They were yep. out in the desert. Yep. Yeah. So that's one question, if you've got any insights into that. And second, I'm a spinner and a weaver, yep. and I look at all the... Um, the linen cloth yep. that was um, specified for the tabernacle, excuse yep, yep. me if I got that wrong, yep. the tent anyway, yep. and I go, how could that civilization have spun and woven those cloths and if there's any evidence for that? That, that always yep. like really yeah, 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 very good question. So, so where does the gold and all that stuff came from? So yeah, and all the materials. So uh, the book of Exodus says that, uh, well, at the start of the book of Exodus, God says to Moses that um, you will plunder the Egyptians. And I think it's Exodus 11 or 12. It does say that basically the women gave, uh, the women of Egypt gave, uh, you know, gold and silver and whatever to them. So I, I'd be assuming that's where they got it from. In terms of, of, of um, uh, uh, one, of the, one of the things to note, that this is really important, the Bible... The things of the Bible are much smaller than, than, um, than we thought they were in Sunday school. So Jericho isn't as big as we saw in Sunday school, but it was, it was still what happened. And I would say the amount of gold that was needed to do the tabernacle was, is probably not as much as we think it is. It's probably a thin layer of gold. And so I would say, yeah, so that's the answer. I haven't looked into it too much. 
I've looked into parallel as what the tabernacle is, but that wasn't your question. So I'm sorry, I'm not sure I can give you a satisfying answer to that one. But I, w but I would say that they, when they planted the Egyptians, that's where they got it from. But sorry, the textiles, textiles may be something the same thing. I'm not sure. I'm sorry. Yep. Just wondering about the archaeological evidence for the scriptures themselves. And yep. like I've heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls, yep. I have no idea about it. Yep. But yeah, what sort of evidence they have there? Okay, so one of the questions is um, when did, when could the um, the biblical accounts be written? And I I see in the ancient Near East there's writing all the time, and, and different levels of society wrote. So I've got no problem with um, the mosaic authorship of the Pentateuch, for example, and I can go into that. Um, but we don't have, the, the first copies of the Old Testament we've got uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, right? We have got uh, the Ketef Hinnom, uh, I forget what they're called, but, but basically it was, it was some silver strips that had that, uh, I think it's number 625, the Lord shall bless you and keep you, that kind of thing. And that's written on some silver strips. It was in a tomb, uh, Ketef Hinnom. And they basically match up with the Bible, right? And so that's from, I think, the 6th century. So you've got in the 6th century something from um, something that's actually written in the Bible, which shows, I think, that at least this phrase was a well-known phrase. And that phrase is actually taken from the Bible. But in terms of can we have we got other copies later than about, I think it's... 200, 100 BC. Unfortunately, we don't. Yeah, thanks, Hans. It was interesting you were talking about what we might have learnt in Sunday school and yep. visions and that. Recently, I watched some lectures by an archaeologist from the US, a guy called Dr. John Delancey. Yep. And talking about Jericho was really interesting because you think, you know, we read the walls fell down. Yep. But his explanation of when they've excavated that and looked at it, actually just parts of the walls fell down yep. according to their interpretation and that's how the, that's how the people got in. So yep. it's not like, yep, all the walls just fell down, but yeah, it was yeah. actually parts of the structure that actually yep. fell down that made yep. it easy for them to get in. Yep. Yeah. Now can I talk to that? And, and Okay. This is... This is um, so in America, you've got archaeologists and they always talk about Jericho, right? Rightly so, because Jericho is a fantastic narrative, right? And what they'll say is they'll talk about um, a specific time where the um, walls of Jericho actually fell out and they didn't, they didn't break up all around. The problem is, in that time that they've got, um, if you read the narrative, Rahab's, Rahab's um, house is built into the wall. That's called a casemate wall, where you would have houses built into that. They didn't have those in Canaan till a fair bit, a couple of hundred years after a lot of those American archaeologists say the walls fell down, right? And so, and so there's some dating issues that I have problems with that uh, some brothers and sisters in Christ would have. And I, and I still believe the walls fell. I just differ on those dates. Why is that important, right? It's important to, to say those things because I think, um, uh, and I think there is evidence for the wall, walls falling down, but um, I think uh, it's important to say those things so that if people go, well, actually, there's evidence to the contrary of that by you know, a sceptical person, they go, oh, well, uh, therefore, if I've heard different evidence to that, therefore the Bible's wrong, no our interpretation of the archaeological evidence may be wrong. That doesn't mean the Bible is wrong. So there's, there's different ways of looking at the archaeology of Jericho and getting the walls fall down. Those guys and there's guys like Scott Stripling would say other things. I think there's other ways of actually looking at the archeo archaeological evidence and saying the same thing. So uh, I still think the walls of Jericho fall down. I just would date it differently. So, yeah. I'm going to take my... Um, hi, I was just wondering, uh, is there any evidence about uh, Nehemiah rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem? Uh, yes, there, uh, Jerusalem's hard. 
because the, the problem with Jerusalem is that there's been many battles there and many destructions and rebuilding and everything. There, is, there are walls that are called Nehemiah's walls, and depending on which archaeologists you talk to, um, they date it differently. The w- reason why they date it differently, and it's hard, is because there's, there wasn't many... Um, there wasn't much pottery or diagnostic pottery to actually date it. But, you know, I'm, I'm pretty confident that we've got Nehemiah's walls there and there's re- rebuildings. We do have... Um, uh, but but there's, there's evidence for... But that... Um, the, the later you get in biblical chronology, the more the, the less sceptical people are of that. And so, yes, I think there's Nehemiah's wall, but archaeologists would debate that. So I'm not sure if that helps. Yeah. Is this question one more? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, I know that it seems like you focus a bit more on ancient civilizations, yep. but do you have any opinions on prehistoric digs? Uh, dinosaurs, how they fit into the Bible, Moses, the flood, etc. So, so, so I talked about the flood. Um, you know, so when you know people ask me what happened to the ark, where's the ark? I say the ark's not there, because you think about it. If there's a flood, it wipes out everything, and you've got all this wood. What are you going to do? You're going to actually rip it apart to build stuff with it. So, I think trying to find an ark is a ridiculous thing to do, right? Um, in terms of um, dinosaurs and that kind of thing, I think, here's what I would say, and this kind of nails and colours to the master me, I think Genesis 1 and 2 is not trying to be a, a scientific account. It's trying to say certain things that God has created with intent and with purpose, right? Now, I think there are huge holes in the, in the theory of evolution, right? I think there's huge holes when, I, when I've read creation accounts, Right? I, I remain agnostic about it, honestly, and I just go, well, God created us, and God created man, man in his image. We're not, uh, we're not monkeys who are to cut, shave, and blow dry. We're created in his image, therefore we've got purpose. But I don't think... Um, when you talk about dinosaurs, you're talking about paleontology, not archaeology, so it's a different field. Um, I think they're fascinating, but I've, I've got nothing more to say than that. Sorry, man. Last question? Yep, one. The Anakim and Nephilim, did you make of them? The Anakim and Nephilim. Um, I hate to end the night on a downer, but I'm not sure. <laughs> not sure. Oh, I will say one thing. Okay, so when uh, in the book of Numbers, I think it's Numbers 13 and 14, when um, I- the Israelites go... And it says in a very specific uh, place, they go very, um, they go to the south of Canaan, the south of Israel, right? We, we, we know the places basically they went to. And what, what they would have seen is not people that are Nephilim or that kind of stuff. Oh, by the way, what you've got to realize about ancient Israelites, they were very, very short. They were, the average height for a man was about this tall. Um, Goliath is only a few inches taller than me. Right? So, so there's that. That's the size. So, you know, how big was Nephilim, that kind of thing? That's that, I, maybe an open question. But they say that there's giants in the land of Canaan. There's the Nephilim, right? Now, we've got no archaeological evidence that there was giants around that time. So what do we do? Is the Bible wrong? Well, there may be a bit of hyperbole, but what we've got in the region that they have is you see these huge walls built with these big stone blocks that are almost as tall as me. And so you can imagine if you're being walking around the desert for ages, if you're a bunch of slaves, and you see these huge blocks, you just think, who could have built this thing? It must have been giants. It must be huge people who we can't attack. So when I look at the book of Genesis and go Nephilim, I'm not sure, but when they mention the book of, in the book of Numbers about Nephilim, I think that's what they may be getting at. So probably doesn't help, but yeah. Cool. All good? Yeah, thank you. Look, I'd like to think of something really meaningful to say, except I think the main thing is thank you very much for fitting us into your schedule. So let's just um, say thank you. Uh, 
just one thing. I'm going to hang out after. I'm only staying at Ian. And Ian and I are pastors, so we only work one day a week. So you can uh, <laughs> ask, us, ask me any questions if you so, want. Okay. So, yeah. And if you hang around here too long, we'll take you back to our place as well. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, now, tomorrow you're speaking... I'm speaking... It's the same talk uh, for um, about 10 AFES people who work in Canberra. Work is it for yeah. AFES? Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, let me lead in prayer, then we'll, you can stay and talk or you can go home. Father in heaven, uh, thank you for what we've been able to learn tonight um, uh, through the study that Hans has done for quite some years. We pray you'd continue to guide him uh, as he reads and we pray as he, as he gets across to the Middle East uh, for that uh, archaeological dig and tour that you would uh, make that a time where he deepens in his understanding of your world and the way that you've worked in your world. Uh, Father, we pray that you'd uh, help him in the church that he serves at, fill him with your Holy Spirit, and that uh, you would use him as your instrument there. We pray for the guys at AFES tomorrow, that they would also find uh, this talk really helpful in their work for you. Uh, Father, guide us in the rest of this night, we ask for Jesus' glory. Amen.